Hello. 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 Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We are delighted to be together in uh, Instagram Live. And I have to say that it's the first time that we do this. I have done hundreds of presentations with the films, but never have done this. And I've been trusted by my team to be the one who initiates this. So uh, bear with me because I'm not the technical one. I'm the one who calls the technical people to help. So thank you for joining us and thank you for being here with us. We are here to talk about milk. We are talking about the milk educational program and we're going to tell you what we are doing, what we are up to and invite you all to join us in this effort to support moms and caregivers and healthcare workers and most important babies and receive them uh, with a good light. Um, just to brief you a little bit, uh, for the ones who have not seen MILK, which I hope a lot of you have, but if you haven't, please visit the website at milkhood.com, um, browse the website, watch the trailer, and, and go to the MILK educational program and see what we have been up to and what are we doing. Just to give you a little bit of a background, what is the MILK educational program? Um, back in 2017, when we were doing a lot of screenings around the world with MILK, it was obvious that the audience had a lot of questions, a lot of needs to further education, and that the film was a catalyst to open up the discussion. So we created the MILK educational program that went around the world with a lot of success. And proud to say that a lot of implementation of changes in communities globally came as a result of the MILK educational program. So now in 2023, uh, thanks to the support of the Telos Fund, who has been a great supporter of the film from the very beginning and now celebrating the, their 10th anniversary, and Milk being the firstborn film that they supported and that gave them as a firstborn a lot of satisfaction, invited us to bring back Milk with the Milk Educational Program. And in thinking about strategies and what moms and babies might need at this time, at a time where we are faced with a world that is really upside down, with a world that is in a lot of emergency, with climate change scaring us day by day. Um, the strategy has been to create a program that will actually be able to help moms and babies at the time of an emergency. And more than anything, be preventative and prepare them in this occasion, so if anything should ever happen, they will know what to do. Uh, this is a topic that is overlooked by the media, is overlooked by a, pretty much everyone. We hear about hundreds of thousands of people that have been misplaced due to wildfires here in Canada over the summer, and we don't hear what's the situation with moms and babies. So that's our program, that's what we are here to do. And we partner um, with Safely Fed Canada, which we are very proud to work with. And I have the pleasure of introducing you here that you can see live, uh, Michelle Branco and Jodine Chase, who have been wonderful to work together and to create a very, very insightful um, educational program that follows the screenings of uh, milk in different communities. So I'm going to give the word to both uh, these beautiful ladies that have been accompanying through the months of preparation to do this, that just to tell us a little bit, Michelle and Jodine, uh, tell the audience what we have been up to uh, and where we've been and, and some of the success stories that we can already share. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're really excited and we uh, are also, I'm doing my first live. And I admit it is also a little stressful for me too. Same with Jodine too. I thought you might've done one before, but Not, really it's, we're all in this. <laughs> so please bear with us. Um, so the, 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 to give you a little bit of, of background on why we were so interested when uh, Naomi came to us about this, this program, um, Jodine, I think was involved in, in the making, in the, the, the process of the 
the making of Milk because she she um, had talked about this film this, that was coming and, and we had the opportunity to see it um, with so many different kinds of audiences and see how powerful it was and how much it moved people. Um, and as we exited the pandemic uh, and started to kind of rethink what, what Safely Fed was going to do, the, the gaps that were um, part of the reason why the organization was formed in the first place after the Fort McMurray wildfires in 2016 were all that much more apparent and all that much more acute, um, particularly as we started to understand that the, the, um, the rate and the intensity of the natural disasters that affect so many communities right across the country are really accelerating and they're becoming more significant uh, in places where we hadn't had that before. So um, this was an opportunity for us to, to uh, take the power of milk and the, the power of it to inspire and to really to really make help people reflect on their own experiences um, and move it into um, an educational program um, using some of the great work that you've done in Kenya and in other places. Um, so we were very excited and we were ex especially excited to be able to sort of pick up two of those those really key themes around the emergencies and the commercial influence on infant feeding and really work those into a workshop. Um, and so that was that was really the catalyst for the, the reasoning for us and we feel like that the film has been um such a, an important central part of that conversation um and the opportunity to do that with you and with with uh the community partners that we're joining across the country has been amazing we put lots of kilometers on the car gonna put lots more on there uh jodine's gonna i think get a few more air miles than i did <laughs> that i'm managing uh, but Jodine, I wonder if you might want to talk a little bit about uh, just what we've heard so far in the places that we've been. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. I, it, we've, uh, so far, we have uh, been, we did a, a tour of what we all like to refer to as Central Canada, here in the West. So um, I joined Michelle in Toronto and Noemi as well, and we uh, visited uh, uh, Toronto the Tyndanaga Mohawk First Nation, Ottawa and Montreal. And I really uh, was very apprehensive, to be honest, about how this was actually going to play out. You know, it makes sense to us. You've seen the film. We've seen how the film is, uh, has such power to move people and to call people to action. Um, but, that's, but that's us. And we were really curious to see what this would be like in community. And right from the very beginning, the gathering in Toronto, Michelle, that we first attended with a group of families who came a lot of people who brought newborns and young babies. I think there were eight babies in that, of about 40 people in that theater. And, you know, right away I realized that the very question that we are hoping that people will ask are exactly the questions that, that came up at the, at the end of the film. I found that to be just so gratifying mm -hmm. because it's those families right now that are that are holding babies in their arms, that are absolutely impacted, and that have the potential to, you know, to support themselves and to support their communities in resilience. If we can only just, you know, get them just the tiniest nudge or the tiniest bit of support uh, to jump in and do and do what's needed. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that's just amazing is when you get you the questions that you would have planted in the audience are exactly what what the parents ask. And especially in community screenings where we have parents who don't have the the sort of the pre the pre the pre reading that a lot of our professional or professional colleagues have had and they, they ask they know they they catch on right away, um, and that's one of the interesting things about this work is that when you start to talk to people about it, it doesn't take a lot of convincing because it's pretty it's pretty clear what what needs to be done and why it's important. Um, and certainly for us, I know that when we first started doing this work, we leaned so hard on uh, the expertise and the knowledge and the the years of experience and research that our colleagues um, throughout the world have have built over time, and we we borrowed from that. Um, and one of the challenges that we've come up against um, has been that while we have a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of expertise in that in, in so many of these areas and we have lots of resources to lean on and lots of traditional knowledge to lean on too, the cold weather um, guidance and the cold weather work has been very hard to come by because it just hasn't been developed because it hasn't been common uh, in the places where we see the most natural disasters um, and armed conflicts sadly too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. 
you know, um, mm -hmm. we have been dealing through the summer with the wildfires and most of the, um, the workshops have been around the wildfires and talking about the displacement. Um, we are going into cold weather right now. So maybe we can share a little bit with the audience. How are we planning to prepare um, the frontline workers and the moms and the babies? Um, so when facing blizzards or facing storms, uh, or if they have to be displaced or any kind of emergency that they will have, how can we prevent any problems and how can we prepare for that? So maybe we can share a little bit about um, what are the challenges and how can we overcome that? Yeah, I, I think that one of the most interesting conversations that I can recall, um, which really underscores why I think we're well positioned in our country, we have expertise, we just haven't played it yet in ways that we, I don't think we've really come to terms with it in some ways, but Michelle and I, right after we formed Safely Fed Canada in Montreal to talk about this work, and a lot of times the first thing that we do is we try to get a sense of who in the, in the group that we're, that we're speaking with, who has had direct experience in being involved in an emergency, who's had been in an emergency situation or a disaster, who has had to evacuate with an infant. Um, and what I wasn't expecting, because in my mind, the Montreal ice storm, the big ice storm where people were with power in some cases for many weeks, was very distant. It seemed very distant in my mind. But right away, people raised their hands and said, I remember the ice storm. I remember being, you know, I just had a baby and my baby was two weeks old and we had no power. Um, you know, I remember some, some younger people remember living through it as, as younger, you know, as children and as adolescents. But it was really clear that these were really important moments in their in their lives. And at the same time, I was really struck by how, even though this was, there was a lot of expertise in the room, done, you know, had experienced some hardship, but had done all the right things. Like there's one woman who talked about when the power went out, just getting into bed with her littles, and they all got together skin to skin because that was keeping them warm under the covers. They had no idea how long it was going to go. And, and we do have understanding and expertise and we we do have the ability to you know to support our families um in ways that if we think about it if we can you know talk on the phone or or chat with other people it's it's not too hard to come to these answers but right away there were people that were in that room who had lived through this and had experience and who were ready to step up and say this is what i did then and let me tell my story and let me talk about what i think Important for people to know. So, um, you know, how many years ago was that now, Michelle? That was probably six or seven years ago. Seven, because it would have been 2016. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it just really, really stuck with me. And then what also stuck with me was I hear these these stories of folks in in a place like Canada who go without power for a few days, for a few weeks, and then we talk to our our colleagues and our friends and people that live way up north who kind of chuckle and say. Well, you know, old. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't have the right tools. I, I know we, we've had some really amazing um, insight from our, our, our friends in, in the Northwest Territories and in, in our, have in some ways brought to life and in some it's never, this has not ever gone away. I've been utilizing the special, uh, what we call a parka and what they call the a muti where they've been carrying their babies inside parkas naked and skin to skin access to the breath for many thousands of years so you know i think sometimes we don't necessarily think about the fact that we do have the cultural deep cultural knowledge right here right here in canada to to address these cold weather hazards so so how how do you what do you recommend moms and babies in term, when there is an emergency um, with hygiene, um, how do you keep water? How, how do you keep the bottle? How, uh, and of course, we want to make sure that that mom is breastfeeding, but that mom might not be breastfeeding. And in that case, what happens? Uh, they, she, she's displaced. Um, she's not at home. Yeah. What, what is the recommendation? Yeah, I think the first, I mean, the first thing is to have thought of this before you're in the moment. 
uh, I mean, be prepared, right? The Boy Scouts taught us that from the beginning. Um, certainly th these conversations and sort of thinking through what you would do if you lost power for 24 hours, for three days, for a week, for two weeks, what that looks like, um, what you would need to move if you suddenly needed to leave your home because there was something flooding or, or some sort of uh, other, other kind of incident, what would you need in the winter to bring with you? So um, I think that one of the questions that we had as we were coming in was what would you need to put in in your in your car kit if you have it if you have a young baby so you might have you know a shovel and some things to, to dig your car out if, it, if it's um if it's stuck but what else do you need in terms of blankets in terms of some snacks in terms of uh water um those those sorts of things are preparing ahead of time uh many of much of the time you're going to be able to shelter at home so you you're not necessarily needing to move uh, but understanding things like you know that the, the importance of skin to skin contact we have a tendency to think that when it's cold you bundle up and you kind of tuck the baby away where they're warm and safe but in fact it's really hard for especially a young baby to keep their their body heat going so in those they really need an adult against them to generate that heat so that they can stay together so understanding that um, which is something that we don't really need to talk about in most parts of the country although our our, our friends in the north certainly are very familiar with the concept um, so those sorts of things is really around having having that that plan and having those those little pieces of knowledge from a hygiene perspective. Um, certainly, the issue around you know if you if you don't have water running water because your pipes are frozen or because the pipes are frozen elsewhere in your city, um, understanding how to uh, boil water to, to make it to make it clean, um, the safety of using snow, the safety of using bottled water, those sorts of things. Um, so we, as much as possible, we want to use, you know, municipal tap water that we know is safe. Uh, the secondary choice would be bottled water, but we don't always have that. Um, and then when we get into other things, we need to start thinking about like a, a risk, a risk assessment. So we might use, you know, we don't have a lot of water, we might use melted snow to wash our hands and we'll use the bottled water to prepare the foods that those sorts of things um, but really the really key thing is to think about it ahead of time and understand where you are so someone who's in rural newfoundland who's five or six hours drive on a good day from a health facility is going to be in a really different position than someone who lives in a condo in downtown toronto or downtown vancouver whose issue might be not so much the distance to help but the distance to the ground right because mm -hmm. if the power goes out you've got 20 stories to go down with a baby um, and you're definitely not bringing your stroller at that point so you know <laughs> you're not that's not happening um, so knowing just sort of thinking about where you are and what you would do um, the other piece is really having those contacts right so having the numbers that you would need to call the people that you would need to call on a physical piece of paper um, so that if your phone dies or it gets damaged or there's some sort of major catastrophic failure of, of uh, power communications that you have a way to, to contact the people you need to contact. Right. So, well, be prepared. Be prepared in all the ways. You know, the word emergency, the word disaster is already something that we try to stay away from. We don't mm -hmm. want to hear about that. And climate change has really affected all of us. Um, mm -hmm. And we are not talking about war. We are not talking about earthquakes but are it's happening around the world um we are going with a program to turkey we are starting in a few weeks because of the aftermath of of the earthquake um so it's important to understand what happens in situations like that and, and hopefully here in canada we don't have to worry about that but we know that bc is preparing for big floods coming up um, from what happened just now in Acapulco a few days ago, and mm -hmm. who knows if it's coming north. Um, so all of those things are important right now in this particular moment of life, which is unfortunate. Um, we have to be prepared for all of this. And these conversations that nobody wants to have are very, very important. And one of the things that I'm curious about what your take is, there's a lot of pregnant women. We heard, for example, in Turkey, there's 14,000 women that are pregnant, ready to give birth after right now. And, and there's no facilities. There's nothing. That's their biggest problem. There's got to be maybe not that big number or maybe bigger number here in Canada. Uh, what happens under an emergency? How does that pregnant woman 
and her husband or her partner or her parents or whoever she's with um, be able to help her at that time? Well, it may not be 14,000 people that are about to give birth in one particular part of the country in an emergency setting, but there are no question every time there's an emergency or an evacuation, there are families that are about to birth, there are families that do birth during evacuations, and there are families that are uh, need to be supported to birth as soon as they arrive. You know, as, as soon as they arrive, it's, uh, it, babies don't stop being born, no matter where they are. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. I mean, one of the things about in terms of preparation is that as you head into this winter season, you know that you're very pregnant. So um, that's one of the th one of the, one of the things that you can foresee, right? So if you know if you're heading into a winter season where you know that there's more likely to be storms and those kinds of disruptions, you know that that's something that that you should make as part of your plan. Um, the 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 I think most most families have access to uh, healthcare providers. So having a little bit of a conversation, especially as you start to get a little bit later in your pregnancy about when you're gonna go to the hospital, part of that is also gonna be what happens if you are unexpectedly uh, in a situation where you can't get access to help or help is slowed down. What kinds of things should you think about? Um, and I think one, one of the problems that we have in, in our society in general is we don't talk a whole lot about birth and people don't really have a whole lot of idea necessarily of how, what, what, how it happens, um, which is one of the beautiful things about your film because it just, it shares that with an, an audience in a way that's so uh, felt both in the heart and in in the body and, and I think that that's actually one of the really powerful parts of the film um, but that, that parents should understand you know if a baby comes unexpectedly that we are able to take care of that we're going to take you know a couple of a couple of things again the skin to skin keeping the baby against us one of the challenges especially if it's cold and people are feeling threatened is, is they automatically want to rub the baby down wrap them up in a thick blanket and put them aside while we while we help the mom what we really want to do is keep the mom and baby together so if we can communicate to people that in general, that when you have a mother and a baby, a parent and a baby who's who've just birthed, keeping the parent and the baby together is like job one. The rest we can kind of work through. We can get, you know, phone calls and emergency responders and so forth. But if we can keep the parent and the baby together after that birth, we've done a whole lot to protect them both. Um, so that's one thing really to if we can start to tell the general public about that information because it likely won't happen to most of us but it might come across our world our lives at some point um and definitely the other piece i think is just acknowledging that when we have an when we have a you know a, a challenging birth that we're going to need to to spend some time uh re sort of coming back together so that parents who've been in an emergency during that early postpartum period or who, who've given birth in, in, in the middle of a disaster are going to need some extra support from their family and from their friends, not just in that period, that immediate period during the disaster, but also as they heal and they come back from that. So that's something certainly in the communities like uh, in the north where we've had where we had lots of evacuations babies who were born away babies who had just been born who were moved away in that period um certainly um those families need extra support not just during the disaster but beyond that too mm -hmm. yeah well, I, I, sorry i was saying i honestly think that we try to overcomplicate things in our modern world and i i think that one if that if there's one take-home message for people um is that uh, we talk about skin to skin in the first few hours after birth and we talk about skin to skin here we've been discussing it as an option to keep people warm in cold weather but what I really think people need to hear is that skin to skin becomes life-saving whether it's uh, a birth that's outside of uh, the kind of care that was anticipated or outside of a facility or whether it is in the uh, you know, hours or days, or even weeks later, if they're if we're if we don't have the right kind of shelter, it really is a life a life saving practice. And we're kind of we're influenced a lot. No, Amy, I know you know this. We're influenced by by what we see in our modern culture. So what we see in our modern culture is the baby is born. We don't see women's bodies in birth on television. You know, we we, we at best we see women birthing with with clothing on, and as Michelle was saying, the baby's bundled up. And it's actually thinking and 
wrapping our heads around and, pr and processing ahead of time, this anticipatory, what would happen? Well, the first thing is that I am going to have, make sure this baby is still skin to skin, right, attached to me, and I'm gonna keep away everybody that tries to take the baby away from me. We need to empower mothers and we need to empower families. We need to empower the, the caregivers, the supporters of grandmothers to really envelop the, the two together and support the two together. and. But it's just such an important piece. Skin to skin is life saving after birth, when, when for for mother and for baby. You know, it reduces the uh, risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, it increases the viability. Like the babies uh, regulate their heart rate and they regulate their temperature. But then you can extend this concept. So whether it's keeping a newborn and a mother that's just birthed together, or whether supporting a mother to care for her toddler together. Um, our instinct, I think, often is to help the mother and to help the family by taking the burden away from her. And we translate it in our minds to taking the baby away from her in an emergency setting that can actually really cause problems. It's so disruptive to do that. So <clears throat> keeping the two together has got to be the takeaway message if we get nothing else across tonight. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, um, we deal a lot in the film with the commercialization and the politics of birth and infant feeding. There's a lot of that uh, that we discuss because it's part of what interrupts that natural uh, that you're mm -hmm. talking about, Jodine. It, it, it really interrupts the natural process of that mom and that baby together. Um, the commercialization of birth, if we are talking about birth, we have seen it in Brazil um, with 90% cesareans and in many other places in the world. And when we talk about breastfeeding, well, we have the infiltration of formula companies that come in. And, and since the pandemic, we, have, we know that there's billions of dollars that are spent in marketing to bring that formula in. But in an emergency situation, when there is no water, there, that parent has been displaced, when there's no hygiene that you were talking about, Michelle, um, we all like gifts, but we're measuring the consequences. So what, what advice and what can we tell the people that are with us right now in, in a succinct way? Because we want to give a glimpse here of what we are all about in the real work of, that we do with the Milk Educational Program, but at least a glimpse of, you know, what do we do in situations like that? You know, I think I think you've nailed exactly the issue. We have a, a desire to help, and our focus in our social s sort of values is that we help with things. So we find things that will help the person, and that is how we help, as opposed to nurturing the relationship. So rather than uh, trying to find a product that's a solution, we, we need to really focus on supporting the relationship because the relationship is really the key, um, the key thing that makes the, the products work, right? So if you have a product and you don't have a parent who cares about a baby, it doesn't matter how much infant formula you have. It doesn't matter how much clean water you have because if you don't have a person who's gonna prepare that and lovingly feed it to responsibly to the baby, they're not gonna be okay regardless. So I think that's one of the things is really we need to start remembering that parenting is about relationships. It's about a connection between a human baby and a human parent. Um, and that our solutions have to be about those relationships, not about products. We use products all the time in emergencies. That's one of the most horrendously wasteful uh, spaces on the planet is the human is humanitarian response because it's all there's just an extraordinary amount of garbage involved. Um, but at the same time, when we're talking about families and we're talking about parents and babies and, and that that period that really tender period where that child is completely dependent on an adult, if they don't have a relationship and they don't have a, an adult who cares about them, it really doesn't matter. So I think that's one of the pieces we, we really talk about. Like we have a tendency to talk about this is breastfeeding, this is you know solids, this is formula feeding, but really from a, from the perspective of the helper, that it's about the person who's in front of you and, and nurturing that connection between the parent and the baby. And the parent knows what, what the baby needs. We just need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
maybe let us know and let the audience know where are we going now with the program? What's the next step? Uh, because we are into the second leg of the milk education. We've done a little bit of, uh, of, of the East Coast, I would call yeah. it, of Canada. But now, where are we going? Well, I am going to be staying close to home uh, and visiting one of my favorite places in the city. I'm going to be at the Toronto Birth Center uh, on November 10th. We're going to be sitting uh, with the community community members uh, in that neighborhood uh, and the midwives and the, the health workers who work out of the Toronto Birth Center, uh, along with the Okama Collective, who also were uh, our co-hosts uh, at our first at our first Toronto sessions. Um, and then I think, but, but right before that, Jodine, you're going to be in, <coughs> in Victoria, right? In Victoria, yeah, there's a screening on Tuesday, November 7th on the evening at Spectrum Community School, and we're really looking forward to um, there. I think that it's you mentioned Sorry. earlier. This, it's okay, I dropped my phone into my lap earlier. Now <laughs> it's <laughs> very steady. <laughs> I can't bring you to anywhere. <laughs> I'm not uh, the one. I'm not the one to do the technical, and I told you, I warned that. Oh, uh, there we go. Uh, I'm looking forward to connecting particularly with families because I know that, um, you know, every year in, in British Columbia, there's this uh, big shakeout thing they have where everybody talks about preparedness for the big one, for the big earthquake. But I, I'm really interested in, in listening to what families who, who are, you know, part of a big preparedness program, what they have to say and what they're, what they're looking for, what their concerns are and what their fears are. And I'm looking forward to their perspective after seeing the film, Noemi. Mm -hmm. And then the, Michelle, the week after, so I'm in there, on, so that's November 7th in Victoria. And then you're going to be November 10th in Toronto. And then we're both going up to Yellow Night. And I think this is a really special screening. <clears throat> I'm going to let you talk about it because I'm losing my voice, I'm afraid. Yeah, we're very, we're, we're, we were very, uh, Honor to be invited uh, to uh, join the uh, midwives of the Northwest the Midwives Association of the Northwest Territories and the naturopathic doctors of the Northwest Territories uh, in uh, Yellow Day, uh, particularly after that um, that community was was evacuated this summer and have now returned, and uh, that's really that's going to be a really special opportunity because parents we were we were chatting with some of the organizers today and we said is there is there any way we can sort of help people understand why this is important and their comment was oh no they understand why this is important right now, um, and that's definitely true I mean that's what we found in communities when we went back when we went to, into Fort McMurray after the wildfire evacuation there I have never seen a more committed. Uh, and persistent audience uh, for our work because they really understood it, uh, not just in theory, uh, but in their in their bodies and in their bones. Um, and so in their very, very uh, near memories. So that's going to be a, a really interesting uh, opportunity. And I think we'll learn at least as much as we as we share with them for sure. Um, and then we're we're off to Edmonton on the third, right? Mm -hmm. Jodine, the third of December. Uh, I think you'll you'll be there in Edmonton, uh, at, and uh, then we'll probably be announcing a couple more uh, as we get as we get organized. And there may be a couple that go that that bleed into January and February as we get people organized as well. Yes, there's a growing amount of interest. I just had someone reach out today who wants to is interested in bringing this program to. Uh, to a, one of our universities where there's a midwifery education program. So I think we'll start to hear some more um, interest there. But uh, there's, there's no question, um, people know that this is needed. We I, we, I don't have enough fingers on either of my hands to count up the recent uh, emergencies and disasters, many of which are overlaid onto other emergencies. And all of us, of course, are just coming out the other side of COVID-19, but there are some communities that had to deal with floods or wildfires, um, well, or tornadoes, while they were also dealing with uh, an active pandemic. Um, and I, there's, there's, uh, it's just become, it's become so, so urgent. Yeah, and it's so mm -hmm. often, it's so often overlooked. And, and that's why the importance of talking about it, right? Because um, we don't hear it in the media. No. And yet we know that that um, a, an emergency disaster, the impact on the community, um, we see immediately that some of the people that are impacted the most are families with very young children. We know that 
uh, families who are breastfeeding, they 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 lose their breastfeeding uh, very quickly, and it's not because they don't wish to continue, but because we don't have systems in place to support that. Um, we also know that that our communities are you know in supporting birthing people, we are experiencing more and more challenges. Uh, there are challenges around facilities that are closing, maternity care facilities are closing, and our healthcare workers are really stretched. And uh, the, so communities that are already in a maternity care crisis are, are really, really vulnerable when we have um, even the smallest of interruptions of our system. So, I mean, this is just such a timely, a timely conversation. We have a few uh, questions from the audience. So I'll start with the first one here. Um, what has been the biggest challenge in implementation? Uh, I think I think actually the biggest challenge has been getting the attention given how many uh, competing priorities there are. And there's when we first started doing this work and I, I sat down with some of the some of our colleagues who, who had been doing this a long time and I just said, I just don't understand how it is that we have emergency plans in place for pets. We have emergency plans in place for elderly people, for all, sor all sorts of different vulnerable groups in, in, in the community. But for some reason, we don't seem to include babies in that. And, and the explanation sort of made sense to me at the time, which was the assumption is, is that babies have an adult, a parent who's looking after them um, and that they already know how to do that. So I think that's one of the challenges is that a lot of the care work that we do is not acknowledged as uh, as a as a something needing resources, it's something we just do in our daily lives. So nobody really pays attention to you know how the baby wipes and the diapers get to the house and, and get you know dispersed <laughs> through through <laughs> through a week. Um, but those are things that went in an emergency, the things that you would normally do in your own home, you can't do anymore. So it's really that support. And there, I mean, there's a gendered aspect to that as well, right? So the work that women do in their homes to care for their families is not acknowledged as being important. But in an emergency, when they can't do that work anymore, it's suddenly extremely obvious. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest challenges is really getting that understanding of the kinds of things that people need and how what happens when they don't. Um, and it's going to be a challenge because there are an enormous number of priorities in the emergency management field right now because it's the, because of the acceleration and this changes in, in patterns that have existed for decades are suddenly now no longer reliable. So it's going to be really important that we put the needs of, of, uh, of infants and babies and pregnant people at the forefront of those conversations because the, the consequences of not doing that um, have a, cast a really long shadow over families. Um, and that's something that we've seen over and over and over again. And part of it is also going to be addressing the, you know, the myths that are pervasive about birth and pregnancy and, and infant feeding in society in general that then get magnified when you get into an emergency too. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. There's another question here. If a uh, baby formula has been frozen, is it safe to thaw it and use it? That depends. <laughs> so, um, generally speaking, a pow like powder that's frozen and, and thawed, I'm not, or I'm not overly worried about. Uh, frozen containers, there can be bulging, so you can break a seal even if you can't tell. Um, so there is one. That's one aspect of it. And freezing once and thawing once is likely not a problem. But if, for example, you had liquid formula in your car. You, it's going to freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. And that's where you start to get a little bit more concerned about contamination or quality. So in general, it depends if it's a, if it's a one time thing, you know how long it's been frozen and, and, and what's happened to it. Um, that's one thing, but certainly something that's been, like, been in a car or been a, in a home where the power has been on and off. So we don't know what's been going on with it. Um, that's something to be to be cautious with. Another Just comment. To add, sorry, Jody, you want to add to that? I'm sorry. I would that. add on. Because I think one of the other things that uh, has come up for people very practically is when you have some formula that's frozen or breast milk that's frozen. Um, although often if you have breast milk that's frozen, you are also breastfeeding. And many people that have formula that's frozen are also breastfeeding. But if you need to feed the baby and you have something that's frozen and it's a really large solid block and you're in a very uh, cold environment where you don't have a lot of heat, 
you want to consider what you what you want to do to to reheat that now of course if you're able to reheat it if you still have fuel then you're able to reheat it you know using the same kinds of safety mechanisms that we might use you may find yourself in a circumstance where you need to put that in your body to melt it or to reheat it and so it, it's helpful to to think about that maybe there's someone else that can use their body to warm the frozen formula while you're using your body to keep the baby warm um, or maybe you only need to warm a small amount of that uh, with someone else's body and then they can pass it on in small amounts for for you to feed um, practically speaking if you find yourself with the need to as as you know the power is going out and as you know you or maybe you're in a vehicle and it's very cold and you know you're going to need to keep something from uh it's going to freeze you might want to think about putting it in small packages in small containers mm -hmm. before it gets so that you can thaw it a little bit more easily the baby will not care that the bottle's been in your armpit don't worry we have a comment here from someone who says last year we lost power for almost a week and everything in my freezer was lost uh including all the pumped milk what can I do to prevent that if that ever happens again? Yeah, this is another one of those things that does not, that is something we in North America are needing to figure out because it is not a phenomenon that happens very, in a, a lot of other places. The, the sort of, um, the phenomenon of having, of people having a freezer full of milk is not really all that common in a lot of the world. Um, if it's, there's a couple things. One is if you know you're losing power, keep that freezer door closed, get your, your, heat, your milk to the middle of the freezer, surround it with as much as you can, and then pack in either newspaper or other things around it. Um, one little trick that we've picked up over the years is to put a, um, a glass of water in the freezer and put a, 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 let it freeze and then put a penny on top so that you'll be able to tell if you leave if that thaws and refreezes, you'll be able to see whether or not whether or not uh, that water has refrozen. Because that's one of the things. If you've left your home, you might lose power for four or five days. The the contents of the freezer melt, but then they refreeze again, and you might not be able to see that. So those are some of the little tips that you can you can pick up. Um, if you're you know if you if you know you need that milk, take out as much as you need for three for maybe three days and leave the rest of it in the freezer um, but after a week it's going to be pretty it's going to be pretty difficult under any circumstances the lucky thing is if it is actually that cold outside you can just put your milk outside um in a free in a, in a cooler or in a bag or in, in whatever and that was something i think we heard lo <laughs> we heard lots of our colleagues i think our friends in, in newfoundland because they had quite this a quite long power to outages um and that was we saw so we got some pictures of of people would put milk, milk, their milk bags into into the snow banks out in front of their house and just kind of cross their fingers that no, nothing was going to get to it. So that I mean that is one of the advantages of, of being in a really cold climate is nothing gets gets uh, thawed. Yeah, I mean there are some small tips too. These are preparedness pieces. I I don't know if everybody has. I'm I'm a little obsessed with this, but I don't know if everybody else has um, a thermostat a thermometer in their fridge which will tell you you know if it's the right temperature um, and you and you can have a thermometer that goes in your freezer as well that's really helpful if you're trying to establish what's the temperature outside is it really enough to keep something cold how long has this been you know at minus five is it, that, it, that's a really inexpensive fix and it can be helpful for peace of mind but I mean as Michelle said um, the, the loss of a freezer staff is a really big loss for many in a cold weather emergency that may be less of an issue but it, but if you have to leave and you are worried about leaving your stash behind um or, or whether with you the one thing we do ask people to consider is please don't delay when you if you have to leave if if you're staying because you're worried about protecting your freezer stash um you you don't want to be someone who has to evacuate through rising freezing flood water with ice chunks in it you want to be the person that's miles away um, comfortably tucked away in in a in a motel room by the side of the road or even in your vehicle by land you don't want to be um, delaying an evacuation because you want to protect your freezer stash so um, if you again from a preparedness perspective if you have a cooler if you have um, 
uh, if you have the ability to have a couple of blocks of ice that, that you keep in your freezer so that you can toss them into your cooler or ice packs so that if you do have to leave you can take some up with you that's that's a good preparedness activity um, and also uh, maintaining lactation even if you have decided you're going to go back to work if you've decided that you are uh, that you that it's time to wean um, breastfeeding just a little bit throughout a long period of time it can be a really helpful preparedness piece because it's actually uh, if you're still breastfeeding a little bit, it's a lot easier to breastfeed a little bit more and a little bit more than if you have are no longer breastfeeding and you're relying on a sachet of milk from your freezer, for example. So try to get people to think about, um, you know, what are the seasonal hazards in your part of the world? You mentioned Newfoundland, Michelle. That's a place that does lose power often, or you have a lot of winter storms. Uh, if you're in an area where there are a lot of wildfires, if you are, if you experience a lot of different kinds of weather, you know, on either of our coasts. Um, if you're coming into the winter season, you know, what we used to think of as flu season, I think now we're going to be calling it COVID season, but that a time when there are additional, um, where there's always a lot of additional respiratory infections. It used to be the standard public health guidance out here on the prairie uh, ago was, um, are you thinking of we is it November? Don't wean until spring. And that was a that was a basic piece of health guidance that we uh, we advised mothers, um, we advised families to keep breastfeeding through that winter season when there's a higher risk of respiratory illness. So you know some of these preparedness pieces um, are some of them. You know I don't I hate to say that they're common sense because that's not really what it is. But it's really thinking about your, about the people around you who may need to be supported. To continue to breastfeed for a few more months or who may need to be supported to do a little bit of preparedness work and then for yourself thinking about the kind of uh, steps that you can take to make it easier for yourself and your family um, through the wildfire season through the storm season through the ice storm season well we have a comment here saying so sad to have to prepare for the increase of climate disaster but this is the reality mm -hmm. and that's unfortunate um, that we have to talk about all these things because if we don't talk it's like we are not, not able to, to to do what we need to do right and and it's important um, that we are all prepared but also that the community in general is not just the mom and the baby and the pair the father or the partner but the community in general so under any type of emergency the call to action is for absolutely everybody i think that we are all agents of change at this time mm. the healthcare facilities um the healthcare workers the frontline responder are everybody's very very busy because there's so much to attend to so there's not that readiness and I think that all of us as a society and each one of us has to be an agent of change, has to be able to understand the needs that society might need, be prepared for it, to be able to act, to be able to support, to be able, and especially a new life into this world, that it's so important. We want to make sure that we give a healthy future for that new baby and that we give that baby all the love that we can do, but mostly that we have the, the common sense that we are talking about. I don't even know if we can call it common sense. Uh, sorry, Jodine, I'm going to refer to that <laughs> because I think that on an emergency situation, there's no common sense anymore. Yes. And that's why, that's why the preparedness that we are talking about, that's why the, the, the preventative uh, possibilities of everything that we can think of just like what we do in the film production you know I always say that if I am feeling good during the filming uh, and the process of, of making the film is because I had had a very good pre-production this is the same thing we need a pre-production for everything we do and right now we need to think about climate change we need to think about what's happening and we need to support uh, the community at large. So I think that this brings us to an end of our conversation. Yeah. I don't know if the audience has anything else to ask. We are here, um, but we, we really welcome everybody to join us in the effort that we are doing. 
Um, it's really grassroots at its best. Um, we are going one by one, traveling it with the with our equipment, with our things to the most obscure little places um, to show the film, to talk about the film, uh, to bring the voices of moms and babies from around the world, the voices of babies and professionals as well, and, and um, to have the wonderful uh, work that uh, Michelle and Jodine have prepared to be able to to really prepare the frontline workers and everybody else to be ready in just in case, just in case. We are not calling for anything bad to happen, but it's good to know and be prepared. So I thank everybody and and uh, please uh, visit milkhood.com, mm -hmm. um, be in touch with our social media platforms, tell everybody about it and help us spread the word because we cannot do it alone. We need all of you. So thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thanks. Very very much, Naomi. We hope right. we'll see a few of you in the various places where we're coming. Yes, all of you. Absolutely. All right. Bye now. Thank Bye -bye. you.